Netherlands uh, at Wageningen University in Research at the Environmental Sciences. And here on the, on, the, on the first slide on the left, you see a small image of some of the work we typically do, which is uh, it's a processing services for uh, the satellite images for the Netherlands, where we calculate green indexes. So you see different views of the Netherlands, and then you can see the gray parts is where there's no image, and the, the colored parts is where we have an image, and we have uh, the data about the green index at a certain month uh, of certain time in the year and you get these nice curves that are below that show you uh, you know what the what what the plant growth was doing or vegetation growth so just it's just to show practically what my what my group is usually doing uh, today we'll talk about a practitioner's approach to open data for agricultural research and i will spot uh, speak a bit from uh, uh um um, I will speak a bit for uh, also for my personal experiences. So, what did I what did I learn myself, and uh, how did I get there, and you know, so that it hopefully makes for a more attractive story to listen to. Um, so this is the contents of my of my talk uh, today. I I plan to speak for about twenty minutes, and then have some oh, of course of uh, some opportunity for questions. Uh, and yeah, please type your questions in the in the chat box so then we can uh, 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 um, that we can uh, that I can answer them. Uh, so um, the points I will talk about are political aspects of open data, methodological frameworks, perspective on open data, personal experiences with open data publishing, and the publishing perspective on open data. I will try to give some concluding remarks. Uh, so uh, let me first go to this political aspects. Why is open data uh, such a topic uh, now? And I think uh, you see here a picture um, uh, uh, of President Obama. So for those who are not seeing it, it there's a picture of President Obama now on the screen. And uh, the reason for showing him is that he, when starting his presidency, he moved quite a lot of people from Silicon Valley to the White House as part of his team. And they, these people, also focused on how can we make, uh, how can we increase innovation, and how can we increase innovation through transparency. And then they thought of open data. They started with uh, 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 and then you, you know, we started with medical, and also at some point they got to talk about publishing research data. So that's one I think in uh, the Obama administration has been a strong driver over the past year. So also in the context of the G8 and the G20, they pushed a lot on open data as a way to uh, increase business innovation. So and these uh, gentlemen, uh, there's a three pictures of uh, Labour MPs uh, uh, from the United Kingdom on the screen now, and they uh, they mean not them specifically. Had an, uh, had an influence on open data, but as a consequence of the uh, of scandals in the UK around spending of uh, MPs, uh, members of parliament, who were spending a lot of amounts on, cr on things, uh, on crazy things, and a lot of the coverage that in the newspaper, there was a strong movement in the UK for making government transparency. Um, so and that I think those two countries, the UK and the US, were really uh, found each other on this sort of transparency. How can we make the government more transparent? And also then on open data, uh, pushing this open data agenda over the past years. Um, why is it relevant to governments to speak about open data? Uh, one one part is it uh, it's about government transparency and accountability. And you can see that I think clearly with the RT standards, where there's a lot of focus on transparency with donor spending and development. And governments try to facilitate that transparency role and accountability role. They make all these data uh, data portals, so data.gov, and there's also a, a Dutch one which is called data.overheid.nl. And, uh, and thereby they show what they are doing themselves. The second role or uh, for governments is improved innovation and business development, where governments want to stimulate their own service sector and assist startups to develop, uh, to see 
open data as a resource that they can use to develop new business models uh, uh, for and then in this way help you know if the startups use the open data as a business then they can uh, they can uh, create jobs and create help the uh, the economy to grow and the third uh, relevance to governments is the improved strategic assessment of decision making and it means that uh, there's an assumption that more data will lead to better decision making because you can better sort of evaluate the trade-offs for example that exist between true policy domains uh, for example climate if you intervene in climate change uh, through cli climate change policy that might hurt your agricultural sector so how do you make a good trade of that and how do you define what are win-wins and you, you know it's easy to do it on opinions of people but if you work with data um, uh, 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 then you can have a better way of decision making and, uh, and that's also then that leads another side effect of that is that different parties can start getting involved if they have data to work with so I mean this is why governments in, in, uh, invest in open data invest in, in uh, sharing information as a result of this, I think, and this is to translate that to agriculture and nutrition, there's the, uh, the GoDa network, which you maybe have heard about, Global Open Data and Agriculture and Nutrition. And here specifically, um, me, myself, I'm working in a project together with the uh, FAO, on, um, on, which is called GoDa Action, which is Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, but then focusing and enabling people in the effective use of open data. This is funded by UKA. So uh, and so, this is examples that came out of this government commitment on open data to further that also in a technical level. Um, uh, the activities we do in this project are improved interoperability of data, so providing improved standards and innovative service, improved tools for impact assessments, so that we have better stories to tell on why open data is relevant and what the added value of it is, and the devalue, development of tailored training courses to increase the capacity of stakeholders to work with open data, much like this course is, I think, hope, hopefully helpful in that sense. Another development where you can see this connect, this commitment of governments more, but then really related to science, is the European Open Science Cloud, uh, which is an initiative of the European Commission. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, there, I think they want to make the whole practice of science more open, and they call that the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and it has to do with uh, with linking data, but also with sharing data as a first step, and then uh, hopefully with also services, computing services, and connecting disciplines across in the sciences. And they want to invest a lot of uh, resources in doing projects differently, so doing science projects differently, which is then called as European Open Science Cloud. They're still thinking a lot on how this should look. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is the, 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 and this is then the setup they chose for that, the, through the European Open Science Cloud. Okay. Um, so uh, let me provide you now, uh, um, uh, uh, with some methodological framework perspectives on open data. Uh, so, you know, if we think about, yeah, the government wants to push open data, or we all want open data society. So how do we understand that it has some benefit for this? Um, so uh, here you can see an approach from the, uh, what we call the innovation, uh, innovation matrix approach. Uh, where you could see, uh, you know, you uh, there's innovations happening a sort of along a sort of spectrum, which could be that you have either new data uh, uh, or existing data that is out there, or you have uh, new applications or existing applications. And if you combine then the new data with the new applications, then you get in sort of a very challenging situation because you don't really know what is there. If you have existing uh, data that you can bring to new applications, then there's a good way to go to in terms of innovation because it helps you to make a small step forward. And similarly, if you have existing 
data for existing applications, that's of course easiest because that's most comfortable. Finally, the existing uh, application with new data, that could also be a step. So I think that's what a lot of what you see in the remote sensing area. Um, uh, uh, so, it, so in this way, with, through this innovation matrix, you can see what's happening. Uh, it's one way to think of how data can create an impact. So another way is um, through this, what we call a uh, more value chain approach, where uh, you, you see a different phases uh, of the value chain uh, data being generated. Uh, um, so, uh, and that, that data might, you know, that comes in different places and you can think of how can we use this data effectively along the value chain uh, approach for agriculture. Now, um, this one is one uh, I see in this slide, there should be a, uh, uh, a sort of a triangle, a pyramid, that's a good word, but it's not here, let me see. Uh, so the, the pyramid, I will try to describe it in words, uh, that moves from data to information, to knowledge, to finally wisdom. And you could say at the bottom of the pyramid, which is the, the broader base, you have a lot of uh, data. So a lot of different data sources, and then you start adding metadata to this to these data sources. You start adding uh, uh, a description of who collected the data and where it is. Um, uh, uh, so that um, and that you can use. Uh, uh, so that um, uh, that gives you that information. If you add. Based on this information, you can combine it. You can combine it using rules like if this threshold is passed, then this will happen, and then you get into the, what we call knowledge. And there is also, in, you know, knowledge services. So the idea that you can bring a lot of information together to create one integrated view. And finally, this this wisdom level, which is the top of the pyramid, which is quite small, where we see it as something that's happening at the. Uh, uh, and something that's happening in the head of the of the decision maker finally so that could be in business or in industry someone who makes a decision finally to either invest in something or change a policy but that's he will use do this based on all the, all the knowledge he gets presented to him but finally it could be a quite small decision that's something you can't automate now we see the role of open data of course to to in this pyramid setup to broaden the base for um uh for making these decisions so um if you have more more data you can create more information more knowledge and thus help the decision making so this is also a way to think about how open data can help to improve decision making now uh finally uh you could see uh this idea of, of road mapping of uh of impact change where if you start thinking uh, backwards from a final impact you want to achieve and then towards the open data that could be helpful that, as an input to that. So here we did some fun, something on uh, 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 precision agriculture uh, using a bit uh, uh, sort of the activities that are usual in precision agriculture which is mapping, sensing, guidance and tracking uh, and then uh, you know linking that to outputs outcomes and finally impacts and in this way this you can you get a, a logical structure of how the inputs of the data you put in and the activities you do on the data lead to good products that you Uh, that you can use. Okay, 
so now I mean now we did some thinking on uh, 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 well I showed you a bit of methodological frameworks of how you can think of impact with open data and what can help to make it really uh, uh, relevant you know to make the data relevant and we also structure the structure the thinking about that a bit but now I will talk more about my personal experiences with open data with open data publishing and uh, and this uh, starts with this paper I wrote in 2009, uh, which is a, uh, it's called a database for integrated assessment of European agricultural systems. It was published in Environmental Science and Policy. Here you can find the link uh, to this. Um, and uh, uh, by now it has, I think, 41 citations and a relative impact of two. Uh, what was interesting when I wrote that paper, and, you know, which is now almost seven or eight years ago, uh, we were writing it with a few colleagues, and uh, the problem was that we couldn't find any examples of uh, references to data sets. So we made the, put a lot of effort in making one integrated data set for agricultural systems that describe the physical, the biophysical, the the climate, the social, the regional, and the farm economic uh, dimensions of farming systems in Europe, but we couldn't find any paper, real example papers of, that did something similar. Uh, so, um, so uh, that led to, I mean, so I was looking around, I remember sort of Googling and thinking, what, why is this, why are there not examples where I can base my paper on to know how other people structure this? Uh, and, um, we, you know, we just invented the structure for the paper, so it was no real basis on, on uh, you know, what headings should you use to describe the data set, what are the relevant aspects to describe. Um, uh, so, uh, I had, uh, so the only examples we found was some in health research, which described the, the problems of sharing data, but not many, not any in the agricultural domain, and not any examples. Um, now, the, I think the interesting point um, of this Sandra, is that Sandra, I'm sorry, later Stu, um, later we some some of our out, participants say know, that you know, because if we you made can this article, increase your volume a bit, we gave, you know, uh, just a little bit uh, maybe. It may be no feed. Back. Because it was available. That we got but contact. Acted by six. of people who want to to use the day
uh, that was installed. carbon management across Europe on disease incidents and economic effects on farms and climate change adaptation at the EU scale and the local scale and land use change modeling. And now a person is working on farming systems in the Mediterranean region. And recently there was another request for linking it to the SDG development. So. Uh, Yeah. Okay, we'll do my best for that. Uh, uh, okay, so I hope it's it's a bit better now. Um, let me know if not. Uh, so uh, now six years later, we there's been all these applications of these data set that we made available and we described. Uh, uh, so um, uh, that's I think a good example. I mean, and the point is not to say, you know, I did a great job here because I made this data available. But at that stage, there was no real example of uh, how we publish data. Uh, and that changed, I think, with all these developments by the political side uh, that um, uh, uh, that, you know, there's much more attention on open data. And that is now, I think, many more data repositories and many more examples of how to publish data. So now let me talk to maybe the real topic of the talk, if you like, but this is this publishing perspective on open data. And um, maybe some of you have are aware of this famous curve on climate change, uh, where uh, which is called the hockey stick curve, and which also sparked a lot of debate. And the discussion here is that, uh, and this is where all the controversy is, of which is of course important to climate change research and, and that this this steep increase towards the end of the hockey stick curve um uh, and uh, now the, this paper got published by a guy called michael mann um uh, in the in a, in a in a paper geophysical research letters um and there were other people who didn't believe that this was actually happening so um based on this curve they wanted to reanalyze the data that michael mann and his colleagues used but they couldn't get hold of it so and i know from the people who were then editing that journal that they had a lot of discussion between them whether they should share that data from the original author group to the sort of climate skeptics um to reanalyze because they thought you know um that that was also potentially a dangerous thing to do because they didn't trust one another. So uh, I think the the solution finally was to then give the data to a third group who was not climate uh, skeptic nor um, uh, nor uh, climate change advocate advocates that they uh, that that third group analyzed the data. And you could see, I mean, the con so there, there was already around this figure, there has been a lot of controversy, uh, whether it's true or not. And around the data behind the figure, there was also controversy in the scientific domain, whether you should share it or not. And I think with the open data uh, discussion, at least it gets much more clear that either, you know, the data cannot be uh, manipulated by someone, but it's also a trustworthy proof that you're really using the right data for making your figures. Um, uh, and I think, uh, so uh, this is this issue of reproducibility. Uh, we also had a famous issue of that in the Netherlands of a, um, a guy, a professor who made up a lot of his data that he was using in his research. So he was a, a social uh, uh, a social scientist uh, in psychology who didn't, who said he collected a lot of data, but then actually didn't do that and just made it up and that they discovered it and it was, a very big thing on getting the trust uh, for trust in science. Now there's also more and more demands from society for openness and transparency, so that taxpayer money is spent well. 
and so science should also show that it is using the, the money well and that means also being transparent on the data that's being used and uh, i think finally as a background there's also these trending topics as big data data science data revolution which put a lot of emphasis on the value of data as a common pool resource so and that yeah, makes people also aware that we should be much more careful of how we deal with our data. Um, now, uh, one thing I did, uh, which is very practical, is to start this uh, journal called the Open Data Journal for Agricultural Research, which is really to f capture the data. So that uh, it's not about publishing pure research, but it's about publishing data sets that people uh, gathered and where they put time on to um uh, so that they are available um uh, we are i mean the i see now the information on this slide is a bit old but there's now uh, 12 submissions uh three published and uh, i think from those three others accepted so coming soon um i did it by linking through the institution so i i asked inra and sija to be involved um so uh, in this way, uh, I hope that people and researchers, there's a practical way for researchers to make their data available. So what is a data journal? It's the same as a regular journal. Uh, the data submitted for the four page explanation of what it is. It's reviewed and that's a very important step and ultimately published with the citation and DOI. They, they, these data articles can be cited, they can be referenced and they add to the publication rep record uh, and one thing we did was to have the data as fully open access with copyright on the author and not on the journal itself um, the pros and cons for researchers I think it's just important to be aware of it it gives a very I think one important point is to have a very easy uh, way uh, of um, uh, of making data sets available so trying to make things as easy uh, for the researcher as possible in a way that they know. They another benefit for researchers that they get the citations to their data set and the digital object identifier. And then not and the third benefit I think which is very important is the licensing is solved on a higher level. So you don't need to think as a researcher with every data set you make or with every whoever you give the data, what's the licensing around this or what's the sharing conditions, including liabilities. And this is I found in my discussion with researchers often something that's not well understood. What's the liability I have if I give my data out uh, uh, to somebody? The drawback is, I think, uh, well, it's not, it's a drawback, but also a good thing is that they need to spend some time on uh, on the metadata so that they adequately des describe it. Um, and another drawback or where people are hesitant is that the published data sets will be used without being appropriately cited in the right research. This, of course, happens with all research that citations go wrong and, and things like this, but they're more worried about it, researchers around data. Um, uh, so fin uh, uh, finally, there's, uh, there's the research funders. I think I showed you You the uh, uh, the European Open Science. Cloud initiative. If they put a lot of effort. on it so that's the you be 